In the mid-1800s, a large clan named the Archers settled in the Lost River area between Martin and Orange counties. At the head of the clan was Martin Archer. Martin had opened a store in Nache, had two daughters who taught school in Orange County, and was regarded as a respectable citizen, at least by some in Nache. To his family, Martin was known as Big Mart. While Martin had some measure of social stature, his brother Tom was known as a rougher character. Tom was connected to the crimes of the Frank and Jesse James gang in Missouri. In a confession, James gang member Cole Younger named Tom Archer as an accomplice for the bank robberies in Russellville, Kentucky in 1868 and St. Genevieve, Missouri in 1873. Tom's three sons followed him into a life of crime. The oldest was John, followed by Sam, and the youngest, named after his uncle Martin, the family called their youngest brother Little Mart. Other members of the gang included Samuel Bunch, an older man who settled in the area after fleeing Tennessee for murder, David Holt, William Holt, John Lynch, who married into the Archer family, Charles Parker, and Kinder Smith, a nephew of the Archers by marriage. Sam Bunch ran a loosely organized group of criminals until the arrival of the Archers. It's not known what, if anything, transpired between Bunch and Martin Archer to cause a change of leadership only that Sam Bunch was leader of the local outlaws one day, and that Martin Archer was leader the next. The Archers took anything they wanted. The gang was responsible for many brutal and cold crimes. Robberies occurred in West Baden, Prospect, Hillham, and other places around the area. Anyone foolish enough to testify or cooperate with authorities would find themselves the center of very unwanted attention. Many a farmer woke in the middle of the night to crops and barns on fire. Some were known to disappear and never be seen again. One story tells of the unfortunate fate of a farmer named Nelson Spaulding. Rumors got around the countryside that Spaulding had hidden a sum of $1,600 somewhere around his home. The archers paid Spaulding a visit one afternoon and demanded he turn over the money. Spaulding refused their demands, so the gang threw a rope over a tree and hoisted the farmer by the neck until he passed out. Spaulding was repeatedly hung and revived until he revealed the location of the money. This was a common tactic by the archers. Spaulding died a few days later from the ordeal. The archers were questioned about the incident, but with lack of any evidence and witnesses being silent, no indictments were brought. This was business as usual for the archers. Problems for the Archer Gang started in 1882. Samuel Bunch, his hired hand Samuel Marley, and 18-year-old Little Mart made a plan to hijack timber being floated down the White River. The three stole a shipment and planned to hide the logs until local authorities stopped looking into the matter. Shortly after hiding the logs, Little Mart came down with a serious fever. Little Mart took a long time convalescing. So, Bunch and Marley became impatient and felt the time had come to sell the logs. The two retrieved the lumber, met their buyers, and split the money. Little Mart eventually recovered, and it didn't take long for him to find out what his partners had done, and he demanded his share of the money. Bunch and Marley refused. Little Mart started making threats. It's not known if the nature of the threats involved the local authorities or the rest of the Archer clan. Either way, Bunch and Marley felt the only way to deal with Little Mart was to end his life. Bunch and Marley drew straws. <laughs> Oddly, the Archer clan were avid churchgoers. On Sunday, July 9, 1882, the rest of the family quickly noticed that Little Mart was absent from services at the Incomb Schoolhouse in Orange County. Little Mart's body, dead from gunshot wounds, was found later that day. He appeared to be on his way to church when he was ambushed. It didn't take Martin and Tom Archer long to make the connection between Little Mart and Sam Marley. Martin Archer gave the gang orders that Marley be found for questioning. Turning up no leads to Marley's whereabouts, Martin Archer ordered Samuel Bunch's farm watched in the event that Bunch was hiding Marley. One night, Bunch put out a red lantern. Martin Archer took this as a signal for Marley. The gang watched for Sam Marley to show his face. When he didn't, Martin Archer ran out of patience. 
Martin, Tom, and the others went to Bunch's house and had Bunch come out. Bunch laughed as he came out to the door. I <laughs> see you haven't found him yet. <laughs> Martin looked at Bunch coldly. No, but we have you. Martin leveled his pistol at Bunch. Following Martin's lead, the rest of the gang drew their pistols. Bunch looked at the gang. He assessed his situation and raised his hands. The gang took Bunch and sat him on a nearby log. Martin did the talking. I'm satisfied you know where Marley is and that you're feeding him. Bunch sat with an amused smile on his face. <laughs> it's all right if you think so. Big Mart replied, You will fix your mind to tell us where Marley is or you will be our guest for a few days. Bunch stayed silent. He was tied and taken away. That day was July 12, 1882. It was the last time anyone outside the Archer Gang saw Samuel Bunch alive. The Archers took Bunch to a cave near French Lake Springs. As Sam Bunch sat on a rock, he looked over the faces of a group of men who were bent on vengeance. Tom Archer, Little Mart's father, Little Mart's brothers, John and Sam, John Lynch, a relative of the Archers by marriage, and Little Mart's namesake, the leader of the clan, Martin Archer. After a time of questioning, Bunch admitted to helping Marley. I gave him the pistol to do the shooting, and twenty dollars so he'd get away. Bunch looked at the Archers defiantly. I would do it again. Martin was still convinced that Marley was hiding nearby. Martin told Bunch, You have five minutes to tell us where Marley is. Bunch said, You don't have the guts to kill me. Martin Archer looked at the rest of his family and said, He has five minutes to tell us where Marley is. If he doesn't, we're all going to shoot him dead. And I'll put a bullet in any one of you who doesn't fire. Five minutes passed. Bunch stayed silent. Martin ordered everyone to raise their guns. Multiple volleys rang out. Martin lowered his gun, went to each member of the gang and inspected their weapons. After being satisfied that all had had a part of killing Bunch, Martin walked to the lifeless body and fired one last shot into the head of the corpse. After the shooting, the archers again attempted to find Marley, who had already escaped to Missouri. Over the next few weeks, news of Bunch's disappearance spread over Martin and Orange counties. In the first days, citizens searched the countryside. Reports say that the archers even joined in the search for the lost man. One Lost River Township resident suggested that they should drag the river. Martin Archer is reported to have said, Yep, drag the river. That's the thing to do. Most in the countryside had a good idea what kind of fate had befallen a man like Samuel Bunch. Authorities questioned the archers about the missing farmer. With no hard evidence, the investigation fizzled out quickly. Fearing someone may find the body, the archers returned to the cave with the other members of the gang. They put Bunch's remains in a wooden box. They hauled the makeshift coffin to a nearby location and doused it with kerosene. After setting it ablaze, soon all that was left of Sam Bunch was bones, ashes, and a few buttons of his clothes that were made by his wife. The remains were buried, and a tree fallen over the grave. The tree's branches hid all evidence of the grave and fire. For four long years, the murder of Sam Bunch went unsolved. It seemed that the archers had gotten away with murder again, but then... John Archer made a mistake that would cost the gang dearly. In 1886, John Archer fled Martin County to avoid prosecution. Deserting his family, John Archer's wife and four children were forced to move to the Martin County Poor Farm near Dover Hill. Not long after becoming a resident, Mrs. Archer learned that John had moved in with a woman from Knox County. John Archer's wife had stayed loyal to him through many things, but this was too much. 
She spoke with Martin County Prosecutor Hiram McCormick. John's wife related the whole tale of how Marley had shot Little Mart and how the family had taken revenge on Bunch. Hearing what Mrs. Archer had to say, McCormick felt there was enough evidence to seek warrants for the arrest of the Archers. In the next few days, Martin County Judge David Heffron issued arrest warrants for the brothers Martin and Tom Archer, Tom Archer's sons, John and Sam, and in-law of the Archers, John Lynch. Working on information from Mrs. Archer, Martin County Sheriff John Padgett tracked John Archer to the farm of one Leroy Boyd near the city of Vincennes. Padgett attempted to issue an arrest warrant, but found that he was outgunned. Padgett returned later with a posse of 15 men. John Archer surrendered, along with David Crane, another member of the gang. Crane was taken into custody on another charge. Tom Archer fled Martin County and made it as far as Missouri. After a night of heavy drinking, Tom made the mistake of boasting about his identity and exploits to a man he had met in a local saloon. The man's name was Miles, who held the office of city marshal. The marshal's office had recently received a wire that the archers were wanted men. Miles arrested Tom and had him returned to Martin County. Martin Archer and John Lynch were also arrested that month. Sam Archer had already fled the county to avoid prosecution on the charge of horse theft. The three archers and Lynch were housed in the Martin County Jail. Sheriff Padgett became aware of rumors that a lynch mob was forming. Padgett had the gang moved to the Davies County Jail for their protection. While at Davies County, John Lynch was approached by an uncle who urged him that his best move was to save himself. Lynch made a full confession and turned state's evidence against the archers. Lynch returned to Martin County and led authorities to the cave where Bunch was murdered. Lynch took them to the tree-covered grave. Authorities cleared the area and found the ashes and bones, along with buttons that were later identified by Mrs. Bunch as the ones she made for her husband. Lynch was transferred to the state prison at Jeffersonville for safekeeping. Finally, having all the evidence they needed to convict the archers, Martin, Tom, and John Archer were returned to the Martin County Jail. On the evening of March 9, 1886, less than one week before the archers were to stand trial, Sheriff John Padgett heard a hard pounding on the front doors of the Martin County Jail. As Padgett went to deal with the commotion, the archers began to get dressed. The only thing they thought it could possibly be was their gang coming to rescue them. After all, this wasn't the first time they had been in a situation like this. Sheriff Padgett was greeted at the door by approximately 100 men in hoods. Padgett quickly tried to secure the large door to the jail. Prepared for the sheriff's reaction, the vigilantes used sledgehammers to knock in the large doors. Once the vigilantes were in, the sheriff was quickly overpowered and bound. The mob quickly turned their attention to the archers. The group used poles with gooseneck ropes to subdue the gang and pin them against the bars. After the cell doors were opened, all three were tied and led to the maple trees that stood in front of the courthouse. A rope was thrown over the tree on the east side of the courthouse walk. Tom Archer, the oldest of the clan at age 60, was hauled in front. A leader of the group asked Tom if he wanted to say any last words. Tom remained silent. Reports of the night say a farmer tried to slip the makeshift noose around Archer's neck, but his hands shook too badly. A man who was supposedly a Shoal saloon keeper took it from the farmer and said, I'll put it around the son of a bitch's neck. Once that was done, vigilantes pulled Tom Archer off the ground. Tom's feet, still sock-clad, hung barely off the ground. Martin Archer, age 45, was the next victim of the crowd's vengeance. He was hung on the same tree as Tom. When offered the chance to speak, he supposedly said, Gentlemen, you're hanging an innocent man. Unswayed. The rope was tightened around the neck of the Archer clan's leader. Martin was lifted next to his brother. One of his slippers fell off his foot and landed next to Tom. 
Tom's son John was the last of the three. He was hung on the west side of the walk. The last thing he saw was the father and uncle he followed into crime hanging in front of him. When the deed was done, the vigilantes crossed the bridge between east and west shoals and fired their revolvers as a signal to the town that the mission was accomplished. The three bodies hung till around 1 p.m. the following day, when they were cut down by Sheriff Paget. That morning, several of the townspeople came to see the grisly spectacle. The bodies were turned over to family members and were interred at Wilmington Cemetery in Orange County. Before the lynching of Mart, Tom, and John, authorities were busy finding the whereabouts of Sam. Once again, John Lynch pointed the law in the right direction. Lynch's sister was romantically involved with Sam. Using information from his sister, Lynch told authorities that Sam was living in Fountain County, using the name Wolvington. The sheriff of Fountain County arrested Sam Archer on March 12, 1886. Because of all of the agitation from the mob lynching in Martin County, Sam Archer was transported to the state prison in Jeffersonville to await trial. Even with the arrest of Sam, the vigilantes were not done with members of the Archer gang. Kinder Smith, the nephew of Thomas and Martin Archer, was at the home of one Bennett Grigsby near the Martin Orange County border. The house was surrounded by a mob of 35 men who quickly went in and dragged Kinder Smith into the woods. Smith saw a noose dangling from a tree. The vigilantes gave Kinder the same treatment that the Archer clan had given so many others. They hung Kinder until he turned black and passed out. The mob dropped him down and revived him. Without asking any questions, the crowd hoisted him back by the neck again until consciousness left his body. The second time they revived Smith, they demanded a confession of his various crimes with the Archer gang. Smith pleaded innocence. A third time, Smith was hung till near death. The mob woke him and again demanded a confession. Again, Smith pled innocence. Unconvinced, the vigilantes then tied Kinder to a nearby tree, and with a thick switch of hickory, Smith was given forty lashes. The mob still demanded a confession. Kander Smith, beaten and bloody, maintained his innocence and begged for mercy. The thirst for vengeance satisfied, Kander Smith was told to leave Martin and Orange Counties forever or face a treatment worse than the one he just received. Kander Smith left the area that day. When it came time to transport John Lynch and Sam Archer back to Martin County, Tensions were still high. Sheriff Paget and Judge David Heffron feared another lynch mob. In their concern, they turned to Indiana Governor Isaac Gray for assistance. Governor Gray responded, The frequent lynching in Indiana of persons charged with a crime is bringing the state into public disgrace. Any attempt by persons to take the law into their own hands must be resisted to the fullest extent. You shall have all the assistance required to maintain the supremacy of law. Very respectfully, Isaac P. Gray, Governor of the State of Indiana, 1886. On the 24th day of March, 1886, Sam Archer and John Lynch were turned over to the custody of Sheriff John Paget. Assisting Paget were deputies Frank Dobbins and Esquire Berry. The group left the state prison in Jeffersonville and made a stop at Seymour before returning to Martin County. While stopped, the group answered questions from newspaper reporters. John Lynch was asked if he was afraid to go back to Shoals. No, sir. I was led into this thing. I know the people won't hang me. Sam Archer says he has an alibi, does he? Well, he'll have a hard time proving it. He was in the cave with me, just like I said before. Archer's tough. About two years ago, he got drunk, went to Dr. Ritter's drugstore in West Baden, and shot it full of holes. Another time, he set fire to a house. An indictment was entered but he was acquitted. They further asked Lynch if he thought he would be treated fairly. <laughs> Fair? I wouldn't be tried in that county for stealing a duck. I could take five men and whip that whole county. The reporters asked Sam Archer about how he felt returning to Martin County. 
Well, I feel sort of uneasy. I'm afraid they won't give me a chance to prove my innocence. But if they do, I'm sure to be acquitted. I did not help murder Bunch. I was sick that night. I know there's a feeling against me out there, but the stories they have about me have been greatly exaggerated. Lynch has talked too much and has injured both of us. We'll ask for a change of venue. Reporters also questioned Sheriff Paget, who sternly responded. I don't like talking to newspaper men about this. They've caused most of this trouble. I wouldn't give ten cents for the lives of these men. If either is acquitted, they'll be mobbed ten hours after being released. The people are terribly excited out there. I think they'll both be convicted, but whether they are or not will make little difference. Both will hang, whether acquitted or convicted. An immense crowd gathered to greet the train carrying Sheriff Paget's group. When the train came to a stop, instead of seeing Paget and his prisoners disembark, they saw soldiers from the Indiana militia come out of the train cars. Good to his word, Governor Isaac Gray ordered a company of 40 soldiers to meet Sheriff Paget and Seymour and provide assistance in protecting the prisoners. A short statement from the company's commander was given to the newspapers that they were prepared to do whatever was necessary to keep the peace during Archer's incarceration and the upcoming judicial proceedings. The soldiers moved the crowd back and formed a protective square that Paget and his group entered. Surrounded by the very public display of armed militiamen, the group made their way to the jailhouse in West Shoals. Sam's trial that summer was presided over by Judge David J. Heffron. The prosecution was directed by Hiram McCormick, with his associates Farrell Gardner and C.S. Dobbins. Judge Heffron appointed pauper attorney F. Mosier and H.Q. Houghton to the defense. McCormick had a strong line of witnesses against Sam Archer. David Crane the member of the Archer gang arrested with John Archer in Knox County turned state's evidence. Crane testified how he participated in the burning of Samuel Bunch's body and that the Archers compelled him by threats to assist. John Lynch recounted the saga of Little Mart's murder and how it led to the killing of Bunch in the cave. The widow of Sam Bunch testified that Martin and Sam Archer came to the house demanding all correspondence dealing with Sam Marley. She questioned them about her husband's whereabouts, but Martin and Sam only replied that she could disappear as easily as her husband had. Mrs. Bunch also identified the buttons found in the bones of the ashes of the grave as those that she had made for her husband. When the prosecution rested its case, the defense offered this version of events from Sam. I was sick the night the murder was committed. Near the house of Bunch, I was taken sick and lay down under a tree. My brother, father, uncle, and Lynch went into Bunch's house, leaving me by the roadside. They never told me about the murder, and I never asked them anything about it. After the defense rested, the jury deliberated for 90 minutes. We, the jury, find the defendant, Samuel Archer, guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the count of the first indictment, and assess his punishment as death. The defense immediately asked for a new trial. The motion was denied. Judge Heffron addressed the newly convicted. It has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt that you willfully and maliciously took the life of Samuel A. Bunch, making you guilty of the charge of murder in the first degree for which you shall suffer death. You shall hang by the neck in the jail yard of West Shoals until you are dead on the ninth day of July, 1886. Judge Heffron ordered the archer to be confined in Martin County Jail to await sentence. After Sam was condemned to die, much of the passion for revenge that had gripped the area for the last few months seemed to fade. There was a strong effort to convince Governor Isaac Gray to commute Sam's sentence to life in prison. The week before Sam was to hang, the governor received a 300-signature petition from Martin County residents asking to give Archer clemency. Governor Gray, weighing the demand for justice, wrote a stay of execution for Sam Archer. Gray put it in his desk and gave orders that the telegraph office be ready, should he decide to send it. Archer was allowed some visitors while he waited for the gallows. Most notable was a Father Fitzpatrick, who led the Catholic congregation at Shoals. 
and Fitzpatrick's associate, Father Slavin. Both were allowed to counsel the condemned. Fitzpatrick, Slavin, and their superior in Indianapolis, Monsignor Bionese, assisted with Sam's appeal to Governor Gray for clemency. The morning of July 9th, family was allowed to visit Sam and say their goodbyes. A short time before 1 p.m., Sheriff Paget came with several deputies and escorted the Archer's relatives out of the jail. With that done, the sheriff returned to Archer. It's time, Sam. The gallows constructed on the Shoals Courtyard were 17 feet high with a platform 12 by 16. The area was enclosed by a 20-foot high wall. Twelve citizens of Martin County were chosen to view the execution on behalf of the court. Along with the Martin County coroner, reporters, and various dignitaries, there were a total of 500 tickets of admission issued inside the enclosure. Outside of the wall was an estimated 5,000 people that came by road, rail, and river to watch the execution. Along with Sheriff Paget and his deputies, Sam Archer was accompanied by Father Fitzpatrick and Father Slavin. Sam was led up to the gallows right before 1 p.m. The crowd of 5,000 cheered when he was placed next to the rope. Despite the tall fence, Archer's head was visible to most outside the enclosure. A bit after 1 p.m., a black hood was placed on Sam's head. All that was left to do was to pull the lever that released the trap door that would end Sam Archer's life. That task fell to Sheriff Paget. At 1.13 p.m., Paget pulled the lever. Witnesses say that the sheriff brought a half pint of whiskey with him into the enclosure. It said that Paget consumed the entire bottle before pulling the lever. The crowd gasped when they saw the black hooded figure fall from view and the rope go taut. At 2 p.m., physicians present and the Martin County coroner pronounced Sam Archer dead. His body was cut down and returned to his family. After the body was carried away, the gallows and scaffolding were torn apart and carried away as mementos. The rope that killed Sam Archer was cut into pieces and given away as souvenirs. With their mission complete, the militia returned to Indianapolis. David Crane, who turned state's evidence against Sam Archer, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for horse theft. Sam Marley was seen once again in Orange County, 20 years after Sam was hung, but stayed only a short time and left as quickly as he came. Kinder Smith was never seen or heard from again by anyone in Martin or Orange counties. Others who operated with the archers were sent to prison on lesser charges, or like Kinder Smith, were persuaded that the area was no longer a good place for them to live. John Lynch, for his services to the state, was sentenced to three years hard labor at the state prison at Jeffersonville. When his sentence was over, Lynch is said to have made his home in Orange County, where he remained a law-abiding citizen. John Lynch died in 1894, bringing this tale of murder, revenge, and betrayal to a close. The courthouse where all the archers lost their lives still stands and is the home of the Martin County Historical Society and the Martin County Museum. The museum can be visited certain months of the year. The Historical Society has information on the archers as well as many fascinating pieces of Martin County's past. People looking for more information about the archers can also find it across the White River in the archives of the Shoals Library. Thanks for watching.